so good to know Jesus. Uh, that is the crux and the question of our very existence. And the question is, do you know him? Or do you know about him? Do you know of him? We've heard the stories and we've seen other folk shout and give God praise. We hear the musicians going to battle with their hands and going to war with their fingers. We hear the praise team lifting up their voices. But the ultimate question lies where you're seated right now. Do you know Jesus? Uh, there was a video uh, posted of a, a man clearly of African descent uh, giving God praise in a worship service. And there was absolutely no difference in the dance that he would have done in the nightclub and the dance that he would have done in a tribal ceremony and the dance that he was doing in church. And people were commenting on the video and saying, it's a shame that he's dancing like that and it's, uh, it's funny and it's ridiculous. And I prayed this, I said, God, if it be your will, won't you send just one or two folk who don't mind telling the world that they know Jesus? One or two folks who have an unadulterated, undignified praise. Somebody say undignified. undignified. Baptist folk, we have a tendency to be real dignified because we have gotten dressed up and we have gotten cute. It's summertime now and uh, all the maxi dresses and sundresses are gonna come out. Don't forget your spanks when you do that. And everybody is gonna be, everybody's gonna be cute and, and dignified, getting their toes done on Saturday. Make sure your toes done when you wear sandals, amen. And everybody's gonna be all nice and get their hair braided. And when you get like that, you get a, a dignified, Praise, because I, I can't mess up my, my toes, I can't mess up my, my outfit, I can't mess up my hair, but this man just simply by his dance had been through something. And if you've ever been through something and come out on the other side of that thing and you know that God is good to you, that's when you develop an undignified praise. David came back from war and there were women, if you don't understand Jewish culture, there were women whose jobs it was to dance. It was women whose jobs it was to sing songs whenever the battles were over. And all of the paid dancers and all of the paid singers were in the street dancing and it got good to David. David jumped out in the middle of the street with all of these folk and begin to dance. And the word that they use for dance in Hebrew is kara. It doesn't mean to shake, it doesn't mean to rattle, but it means to jump up and turn around. David had a kara praise and danced himself out of his outer garments, danced himself out of his shame, danced himself out of the embarrassment of who was sitting next to him and looking at him. And I wish, I pray to God that we would to have some undignified, unadulterated, unafraid, unashamed people who would not mind giving God praise because when I think about how good he's been in my life, think about how he's brought me over the highways and the byways, just telling my children yesterday, I am the embodiment of God's grace because I could have been dead I should have been gone. I could have been on alcohol. I could have been a drug addict. I could have been in the street. I could have been a gang member, but nothing but the grace of God has brought me this far. And so I refuse to act dignified. Somebody told me that I don't dress dignified. Well, that's true. I don't dress dignified. Somebody told me I don't act dignified. That's true. You might not even want to catch me when 92.3 is on in the car. I dance just like everybody else. Amen. Because I remember a time where I couldn't separate 
my flesh from my spirit. I remember a time when God could have abandoned me, but he stayed with me. So today, as you stand and open your Bibles, I want you to, to shed yourself of your outer garments. Shed and rid yourself of whatever may be holding you back. That person who's sitting next to you who mean mugged you when you came into church, forget about them because their spirit is troubled already. Don't let nobody bring down what God has put up in your life. Amen. Won't you turn with me to 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses, ah, we'll just do verse 7. 2 Timothy 4 and 7. Amen for the table of contents. Amen. Amen. Don't let the enemy trick you into thinking you remember where stuff is. Anybody over 40 will tell you that your memory gets a little shaky. Amen. After 40, my memory didn't got funny. My vision got funny. I didn't had my second uh, glasses prescription in the past year. And you know what? Depending on the day, this prescription don't work. Sometimes I look and the glasses work. Sometimes I look and they don't work. And they didn't gave me something called an invisible line in the glasses. They say if I hold my head up this way, I'm supposed to see something. And if I hold my head down like this, I'm supposed to see something else. I tell you what, sometimes I can't see nothing at all. And I just have to take them off, or I do like my dad used to do, and he'll have to take it, keep the glasses, but put the thing in focus. Whatever it is, you have to pull it and push it. So some of us, I can look around the room right now and tell you that some of y'all need big letter Bibles. Don't be ashamed to get a big letter Bible, or don't be ashamed to get you a smartphone where you can pinch and pull and make your screen bigger than it needs to be. Because if you are acting like you're reading the scripture and you're not internalizing it, then you're going off of what I told you as opposed to what God can reveal to you by reading it yourself. 2 Timothy 4 and 7, New King James Version, it reads as this. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I'll say it again. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I just want to talk to you just for the next 18 minutes about the story of the three little pigs. The story of the three little pigs. Today is our boot camp Sunday and for those who know boot camp Sunday is generally an opportunity for us to take a dive into some things that we may not normally take a dive into on a Sunday morning. So right now I'm going to ask those who are taking notes, take out your pens and your pencils because I'm going to ask you to write things down so that we can make sure that we're all on the same page. Amen. If you're typing electronically, make sure that you have your devices ready and so that we can get on the same page. Just a little bit of information and background about me for those who don't know. I uh, am a uh, undergraduate of Illinois State University in the town of Normal, Illinois, where I graduated with a degree in middle school education uh, with an emphasis on language arts and reading and minors in music. And so I uh, was supposed to be a language arts teacher. Um, I was doing my student teaching in the fall of 1997 and I was doing a great job in student teaching, teaching eighth grade uh, English and eighth grade uh, grammar and literature and I went to a job fair and there were many employers there. I went on my lunch break and I met uh, recruiters from major insurance companies all across the country and had job interviews and opportunities to, to go into the insurance field uh, on the operation side of the ball. At this time, uh, this was around October, Carolyn was six months old at this time. Gabby and I had been married just almost two years and we had a six month old baby. We were living in graduate housing, which really consisted of, oh, maybe a 10 by 15 brick apartment. Amen. It, did, it was a, a real tiny space, Deacon, and uh, we were living there, and I was student teaching, and I went to this job interview, and um, uh, they offered me a job. I remember 
they offered me the job. I remember the day they offered me the job. And I don't say this to brag, because this is 1997. I'm broke. I ain't never had nothing. That woman called me and, from State Farm Insurance, and she said, uh, Mr. Miller, I know that you know, you're student teaching. I don't want to take up a lot of your time. Um, but we would like to make you a job off. I said, oh, OK. Yeah, what, what you talking about? She said, uh, is 28 320 too much? I said, 28, 20, 28 dollars an hour? She said, no, $28,320 a year. I said, yeah, hold on a second. <laughs> now, again, I'm a broke college student. I ain't got no money. I got a six-month-old baby. I'm supposed to be going to teach children eighth-grade English and literature. But this woman called me and offered me $28,320, not to start work next week, but we're going to give you Christmas break and you come in on January 5th. I said, thank you, Jesus. So I went into my student teaching assignment. I'm skipping through the school after lunch. And I talked to my coordinating teacher, and I told her, um, I'm going to do what I need to do to get on through this through December 13th, but after this date, I'm not teaching. I went back to my core uh, group of professors and uh, classmates that night at class, and we were talking about job opportunities, and everybody was saying, well, I got a, an assistant uh, driver's ed job that paid $12,000 a year. I got a job that's going to move me to Texas, and I might get a student teaching opportunity. And I said, well, I'm not teaching nothing because State Farm Insurance called me and told me 28320. I will never forget that number for the rest of my life. But I will also never forget the look on the face of my coordinating professor when she looked at me and said that the world needs black men to teach. And I had a choice to make. Was I going to put food on my table or was I going to work at one of the junior high schools who had a pregnant teacher who was going to be out for six months and that I could possibly work as an assistant driver's ed teacher? How many folk would have chose the driver's ed teacher by the name? Raise your hand. Driver's ed teachers? Any driver's ed teachers? How many folks would have took the 28320? Raise your hand. Amen. I chose the 28320. Started work at State Farm January 8th, 2000, uh, 1998. And so some 15, what, 17 years later, I'm still at the same company. And this is how God works. Because I did not go into teaching in January of uh, 1998, you all become my English class today. <laughs> Amen. So take out your pens, take out your pencils. And allow me to step you into uh, a place of literature that is familiar to many of us, most of us. There's a story. It says, once upon a time, there were three little pigs. One pig built a house of straw, while the second pig built his house with sticks. They built their houses very quickly and then sang and danced all day because they were lazy. The third pig worked hard all day and built his house with bricks. Then a big bad wolf saw that the two little pigs, while they were dancing and playing, he thought, what a juicy and tender meal they will make. He chased the two pigs and they ran and hid in their houses. The big bad wolf went to the first house and he said, little pig, little pig. Let me in. And what did the pig tell him? And so the wolf, he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house down. The frightened little pig ran to his brother's house, the second pin's house that was made out of sticks. And the big bad wolf feeling big and bad, he walked up and he came to the second house and he said, little pig, little pig, let me in. And what would they reply? So he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house down. But the two pigs ran to their brother's house. Their brother had built his house out of bricks. And they're all in the house, and the, pig, the, the wolf 
looked and he said, I blew down the straw house, I blew down the, 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 the stick house, and now I'm presented with a challenge. When we look at our biblical text, the Apostle Paul is speaking in a tense that allows us to let us know that he has completed a task. I need everybody to write this. Write, I have done God's will. Write it down. I have done God's will. And directly under that, I want you to write it again, but I want you to put a space. So I want you to say, I blank done God's will. I blank done God's will. What's the first line say? What's the second line say? First line? Second line. The Apostle Paul had come to the end of his life. He had been in ministry. He had gone through some things, some changes. Many of you know the biblical story. His original name was Saul. He was a persecutor of the Christians. He was a persecutor of those who followed Christ. And then he was on his way somewhere and the light of the Lord blinded him. Some of us can remember a time in our lives. We thought we were going one place, but then God showed up in our lives. Those times where we thought we had it all figured out. We had it all in control. But when God steps in and shines a light on us, it not only illuminates us, but it illuminates our ability to see him more clearly. And Saul went through a transition to where he went from being Saul the persecutor to Paul the proclaimer. And here we have him writing a letter to his son in the ministry, Timothy. And in this letter... He he has telling Timothy, I'm writing you from a jail and I don't have much time left. I've come to the end of my life and I just need to think about some things that have happened. There are some members in our church right now because our, ministry, our demographic is such that we have more senior members than we have younger members. And so seniors, just for a minute, some of y'all can testify that as you get further down the road, you begin begin to look back over your life and begin to see the things that you did and the things that you did not do. The things that you wish you could do over. The places that you wish you had gone. The things that you wish you could have done a little bit better. The, the way, the times you wish you could have hugged your mother just one more time. The time you wish you hadn't gotten tough with your daddy and walked out the room mad. All of the things in your life begin to come back to you. And like the Apostle Paul, you begin to remember what you have done. And Paul tells us three things. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. But there is a problem with you and a problem with me as Christians in 2015. The problem is, is that we don't have the word have working in our daily testimony. We have a blank. And in that blank, we have three pigs. The first pig is named Coulda Pig. I want you to write that down. C-O-U-L-D-A, Coulda Pig. That is slang for could have. I coulda done the will of God. I, I, I coulda been somebody I coulda and see coulda pig built his house on what we would like to call past possibilities he could have done something he could have been somewhere. He could have gone somewhere. But whenever you use this, uh, this third person past participle with the word have, you are now saying to yourself that I had a choice. Could a pig had a choice. Touch somebody and say you have a choice. 
when you look back over your life, there are some coulda pig times in your life where you had the choice to either go left or go right. I could have done the right thing. I could have said the right thing. I could have shut my mouth when I knew it was not time for me to talk. I could have done it. I could have done it. You were capable of making a choice, but the choice you made was the wrong choice. Anybody ever had some coulda moments in your life? You look back and say, I could have done that. But sometimes when you have those opportunities to make decisions, fear creeps in. And when you build your house out of past possibilities and out of fear, the enemy will walk right up and begin to huff and begin to puff and he will blow your house of possibilities right out of the water because he knows that you are afraid, not of what you could not be, but you're afraid of what you could be. Many of us don't have the fear, the fear of failure. We have the fear of success. Because if I get it right one time, the expectation from everybody around me will be that I get it right every time after that. And some of us live on a coulda pig faith and the enemy is blowing our houses to shreds. Somebody say coulda pig. But when the enemy blows down coulda pig's house of past possibilities, coulda pig runs to his brother's house. His name is water pig. See, coulda pig was living on past possibilities and had a choice in the matter. But water pig is in a different situation because water pig is a victim of circumstance. Wooda pig could not control what happened in his life. Wooda pig could not say that these things for certain were going to occur and there are certain things in your life that you can't control. Put your pen down, put your hand on yourself and say, Self, there are certain things in my life that I cannot control. So let me tell you something. Stop trying to control them. Some stuff you can't fix. But I know somebody who can. And if he can't fix it, he will fix our hearts to such a way that we will be able to endure it until the end of the day. What a pig is a victim of circumstance. If I hadn't faced a crisis in my life, then I would have graduated from college. If I, would, if I didn't have my money run out, then I would have finished college. How many folks graduated college? Raise your hand. Went to school and graduated. How many people did not finish college? Come on, raise your hand. You went or you're still going? You plan on going? You'd like to go? This is a situation. Sometimes in your life, things come up. There's some times you may save some money for something and something else comes up. I would have gone on my vacation, but I had to pay my bills. When things come up in your life that you cannot control, but then you make the excuse that you're going to build your life on things simply because they're out of your control, that's when you're operating with a a wood pig spirit. Because we make excuses for things that we could have simply either reached out to God for or reached out to another brother brother or sister in Christ for and we hang on to our excuses and excuses are this if you're writing write it down excuses you got it are the tools of the incompetent excuses are the tools of the incompetent They build monuments of nothingness. They build monuments of nothingness. And those who use them, and those who use them are often not worth much more. 
those who use them are often not worth much more. Excuses are what? The tools of the incompetent. What next? Excuses, again. Excuses are the tools of the economy. They build monuments of nothingness, and those who use them are often not worth much more. What does that mean to you? When we make excuses, we're not building a house that's built, built based on anything at all. Excuses build monuments of nothingness. You can have all the excuses, I woulda, I woulda, I woulda, I woulda, but God is asking you, what will you do? What will you do for the church? We are studying on Wednesday night the autopsy of a deceased church. Twelve ways to make sure that your church ain't one of them. And if you're not a part of the solution, tap somebody, tell them. You are a part of the problem. If you are constantly making excuses of what we would have done and what we could have done, then you are not doing anything to build the foundation of God's church. Because when the enemy comes in, he don't care how much you read the Bible. He don't care how much you give and sacrificial giving. He is looking for any chink in your armor to where he can find a coulda praise or a would of praise so that he can attack you and knock you off of what God has intended for you. Somebody say could a pig. He lived his life based on past possibilities. Somebody say would a pig. He lived his life as a victim of circumstance, but when the wolf came and blew down Coulda Pig's house and then blew down Woulda Pig's house, y'all know his other brother. What's the other brother's name? Come on, come on, linear thinkers. What's the other brother's name? Shoulda pig. Coulda pig and woulda pig. They ran to their big brother's house. Shoulda pig. Now, shoulda pig is that pig, that, that member, that person, that Christian who lives their life 20 years in the past. We shoulda done this, reverend. We should have done that, Brother Deacons. Uh, if I was in charge, we should have done this, that, and the other. There's some folk in the church right now. As a matter of fact, if you don't know nobody, it's probably you. Always talking about what should have been. You can look back at hindsight, it's 2020. We can all look back and say what should have did. But, but, but my question is, what did you do when it was time to do something? What did you say when it was time to open up your mouth? Because when there is something right or something good in our past, that's when we invoke the shoulda praise. A past duty or an obligation in our lives that has been left unfinished. Some of us can look back right now at some stuff that is left unfinished in your life. Some relationships that you broke off and left them unfinished. Some tasks in your life that you broke off and you left them unfinished. When you use the word should have, the contraction should have, or the colloquialism should have, whenever you use that, it's talking about a past obligation. Something that you did not get done. I want you to know today that we all have a shoulda pig spirit. I can look back over my life and there's some stuff that I should have done differently. There's some stuff that I should have said differently. But here's the good thing about grace. Somebody say grace. Grace allowed me just one more day so that I can look back and say I should have done it then. But now I got an opportunity to fix it up right now. 
as long as I have breath in my body, there is a possibility, somebody say possibility, a possibility that I can move beyond what should have happened and I can move into what God is getting ready to do in my life. The will of God is such that it doesn't matter what you used to do. God is more concerned about where you are right now because of what he's getting ready to do in your life. Some of us are so stuck on should have been that we cannot see that God is working right now in your life. The first thing I had you write down was what? What's the first sentence I had you write down? I have done the will of God. Go to the second line with the blank and fill it in with your three pigs. What's the first pig name? Coulda. And write that in. I coulda done the will of God. Somebody say, I woulda done the will of God. Somebody else said, I shoulda done the will of God. And every time you put one of those three pigs active in your spiritual life, you are subject to the enemy coming up to your house and blowing it down. But somebody else say, there's another brother. See, this is the brother we don't hear about. The brother that folk don't talk about. Because there's always somebody, if you shake your family tree, you got an extra cousin in there. Somebody that show up at the family reunion and look like everybody else and ain't nobody told you how you related to this person. Come on, am I the only one? This person looked just like your Aunt Susie and just like your Uncle Big Boy, but ain't nobody told you how this person is your cousin. Everybody got a family member that shows up extra and you ain't quite sure where they came from. Could a pig thought that would a pig and should a pig were his only siblings. And so when they built their house on things that were not firm and built their house on things that were not eternal, they thought that their lives were done. They thought that their lives were over. And could a pig said, Lord, I could have done your will but I, I chose to go another direction and would have pig said I would have done your will Lord but I didn't have the right suit and dress to wear to church Lord should have pig said I should have done your will Lord but because they talked about me so bad I didn't go back to the church no more and then an old person comes up with his broken grammar and undignified self and say I'm going to tell you about another brother his name is good a pig see because good a pig is the one that no matter how bad your life is he just keeps getting gooder and gooder as the day goes by I know that ain't good English. I know that's not what they taught me at Illinois State University, but I don't serve a better God. I serve a gooder God because every day he just gets gooder and gooder. Every day he just gets sweeter and sweeter. Every day he just keep making things right. I could have been dead and gone. I, I would have been saved, but I went another direction. I should have been on drugs and crack cocaine, but I serve a gooder God. He's so good. That he looked beyond my faults and he saw my needs. He's so good that when I could have been out there by myself, he sat with me and he wrapped his arms around me. He's so good when I could have been shot in my head because I thought I was a gangbanger. He just keeps on being gooder. Somebody say gooder. And gooder as the day goes by. I know some of y'all dignified English teachers and principals in the room may be looking at me right now and said, I can't believe this man of God who has a Bachelor of Arts in Language Arts and Reading and who has a Master's of Divinity would get up here and speak broken English like that. But I want to tell you something that my professor of old school prophets told me. Dr. Jerome Ross said, there are no good words and no bad words. There are only ineffective words. And if you use your words correctly, you might get the result that you're looking for. And if you use your wrong words the wrong way, you might not come up on what you thought you should have come up on. Some of us dignified folk like to get on our knees and say, Lord, I thank you 
for all that you've done for me. You have blessed me and you have done wonderful and mighty things in my life. And for that, Lord, I say thank you that I'm not like that guy Ivan over there playing the keyboard. I saw him in the grocery store, in the liquor aisle, buying plain potato chips and red Moscato, Jesus. I thank God that I'm not like him. Lord, and if you would hear my prayer, Lord, and bless me, I'm certain that I will be able to bless someone like Mr. Ivan the next time that I catch him in the potato chip and liquor aisle at Walmart, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Those words sound real good and they tickle the ear. But I know a God and I know some old folk who used to get down on their knees and they didn't have all those words to say the right stuff. They didn't know how to put a subject and a verb and a predicate together. They didn't understand creating a sentence in the past using the participle have and making it sound right. But they just said, Lord, my Lord, I'm coming to you now, God, because I don't know any other way how to do it. I look back over my life at the things that I could have done. Lord, I look back over my life at the thing I should have done. Lord, I look back over my life at the thing that I would have done. And none of those could have things. And none of those would have things. And none of those should have things amount to much, God. But I just want to thank you for being a good of God. I want to thank you for being a good of God. When the enemy tried to snuff me out, you were a good of God. When my friends talked about me, you were a good of God. When my mama turned her back on me, you were a good of God. I may not have much education. I may not have gone to the college, but God, I've been to the school of hard knocks. And it's a hard knock life for us. Instead of kisses, we get kicks. But God, every time the enemy kicks against me, I just tell him I serve a good God. One that looks after me, he's so good. One who makes a way for me, he's so good. One who keeps on doing great things for me. He keeps on doing good things for me and right now I pray for brother Ivan who was in the liquor aisle buying potato chips I pray because there was a time I was in the liquor aisle buying, matter of fact it was last week I was in the liquor aisle buying potato chips and red Moscato but I realized had it not been for the grace of God on my side I could have gone where would I be I serve a good of God. Good of God. He's yes. so good. Jesus. Oh, yeah. I could have been. Mm. I would have been. Yeah, yeah. I should have been. Jesus. But I thank God thank you, Lord. Yes. for that big brother. Thank you, Lord. Because mm. when could have and would have and should have showed up at Gooda's door. Gooda said, in my father's house. Y'all don't even know when to shout. Jesus. In Hallelujah. my father's house. Yes. There are Hallelujah. many mansions. Yes. They're you. not made out of sticks, Gooda. Yes. They're not made out of straw, Woulda. They're not even made out of bricks. But in my father's house, there's a building not made by man's hands. And the cornerstone thereof is the one that the builders rejected. They said he wasn't worthy to be the cornerstone to hold up a Swansboro Baptist church. They said he wasn't worthy to be the cornerstone to be the one that held up civilization. But God looks at the heart while man looks at the outside. And there's some peculiar looking stones out here today. But I dare you to get a good of God spirit. And know that your father has a mansion. 
prepared for you. Thank you, Lord. In a building. Yes. Not made. Thank you, Lord. By hand. Repeat after me. I could have done God's will. I would have done God's will. I should have done God's will. But guess what? I have done God's will. Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, he said, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all of those who have loved his appearing. Come on, give God a praise, the good of God. Come on. Give him praise, give him praise. Could have been, would have been, should have been. But he's a good of God. He's gooder to me. Then I've been to myself. He's gooder and gooder as the days go by. Is there one who wants to know Jesus today? Can everyone stand? It's so good to know Jesus, to know him for yourself. Not because I preached about him, but it's so good to know to Jesus.